Thank you. Thank you. So, Dr. Tyson, or if you prefer Neil, in this intimate setting of 3,500 people. By the way, I, didn't, I don't think I ever said that to become scientifically illiterate is to know when other people are full of... Uh, I think I said to know when they're full of bologna sandwich or something. <laughs> Good that we're clearing that yes. up. Yes. <laughs> um, so, our beloved personal astrophysicist, Neil, is about to become the world's astrophysicist tomorrow night, in fact, when Cosmos airs. When Cosmos airs, and this is unprecedented, I understand, in television history, in 170 countries, 45 languages. Yeah, it's the largest rollout of a television series in the history of television. So there's very high expectations that not only the Fox network has placed on it, but Fox is a major investor in National Geographic. You might not have known that. And so this world distribution is primarily through the National Geographic network. Right, exactly. Yeah. And we're fortunate to have this final last hour before you go global tomorrow. And so I'm very honored, and we should all be very honored to have this last hour after he's just completed weeks upon weeks of interviews and travel. We basically ended it here <laughs> in Austin, just so you know. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> um, so, so let's get down to business. Um, mm -hmm. Cosmos is not your everyday run-of-the-mill science documentary. I mean, first of all, it is one of the executive producers is the multi-talented Seth MacFarlane of Family Guy fame, and it's on the Fox network, and it's got, presumably, it will have beautiful Hollywood special effects, care of Bill Pope. So, Given all of this, given that it is so remarkably different from the average science documentary, um, what's its job? What do you hope it will achieve? Well, so your typical documentary, when you think of them, involves a lot of let's put the camera on the tripod and interview the, the expert, and then you go to the next expert, and then you stitch it together. And so it's very, they tend to be informative, and that serves an important role in the television portfolio. But Cosmos, in its original incarnation in 1980, as well as what we have done to continue that story, is, has always been more than that. It's managed to take the science that's out there, put a thread from that science through you and onto elements of the universe that show you why that science matters to you and how, it, and how you might be compelled to respond in the face of that information. And by the end of a show, and especially by the end of the series, we like to think that we've sort of woven this tapestry with that thread, with you in the center of the tapestry, and you get to look around and say, now I know and understand my place in the universe. And that's, that's a very different kind of messaging from here's a page from a textbook or a wiki page, read it, and now you know something. It's, it's it, to also feel the knowledge, mm -hmm. we have found makes you take ownership of that knowledge <laughs> so that you then become affected, if not permanently, certainly uh, it alters your, your perspective on the world, what, what we call a cosmic perspective. A tremendous amount of inspiration is the first step. It's a necessary but maybe not completely sufficient route to science literacy. Well, I also, when I think of science literacy, I don't think of a body of knowledge. Mm -hmm. It was announced in the introduction that one in four Americans doesn't give the right answer to the question, who goes, who, who orbits what, right? Earth around the sun or the sun around the earth. And you know something? That doesn't even bother me as much as it bothers other people because no one on earth would have gotten the right answer to that question before the year 1600, mm -hmm. all right? Or before the year 15. 43. Uh, so, so this is acquired knowledge that searchers of cosmic truths have arrived at over the centuries. And I'm not going to require that you have this body of knowledge. I'd like it if you did, but I'm, I'm not going to require that. What I want you, what I prefer, my personal definition of science literacy is how much do you still wonder about the world around you? What is your state of curiosity? 
How much, when you pass something that you don't know or understand, do you pause and reflect on what the answer might be? Mm -hmm. To me, that is the essence of science literacy. And all children do this. Children walk around and they, they turn over rocks and they break stuff. And, and we as adults try to constrain that activity when it's all exploratory. Mm -hmm. And it's the exploration for me, that is the science literacy. And when you explore, all those answers come for free. So I don't want to just hand out answers, because if I do that and something new comes around, you might then complain that it conf conflicts with your philosophy, because you didn't have the curiosity right. to wonder how we came to know that was true in the first place. Right, and to remain curious is to remain young. Yeah, I, I think a scientist is just a kid who never really grew up. Because kids love, yeah, <laughs> that's very true. They want to know if you hit this thing, something else will happen. And I know from my own experience with my one-year-old, she likes to hit a lot of things that Oh, yeah, things will and I bet, and here's something I don't want you to do with your one-year-old. You ready? I am ready. Because this is going to happen. One day, if it hasn't happened already, your one-year-old is going to take all the pots and pans out oh, of the cabinet. Yes. And put it on the kitchen floor and start banging on it with the wooden spoon. These are experiments in acoustics, okay? <laughs> so you should just let that go. Don't say you're making a racket, you're getting the pots dirty. Yes, she's making a racket. Yes, she's getting the pots dirty. But that is a small price to pay for the, the, the awareness of what a wooden spoon sounds like versus a metal spoon or a copper pot versus an aluminum pot. All this is going on in that experiment. And yes, go ahead and clean up after. Did you have kids so that you don't have a messy house? That's, that's not why you had kids. What's more important, do your kids or your house? <laughs> I vote kids. Houses can be repaired. Yes. But that essential curiosity is critical as we all grow older as well, because that's essentially how you learn. Yeah, and as adults, we have this urge to tell people what the results of some experiment will be, mm -hmm. because you happen to know the answer, mm -hmm. and that denies the person the experiment. My son, I forgot how old he was, six or something. He was drinking water in a glass where the sides of the glass were parallel. And it was an, a glass of ice water and the air was humid. So you had this beating up of water on the mm. condensation from the air's humidity on the outside of the glass. And I said to him, Travis, put a little pinky underneath uh, yeah. to prevent it from sliding yeah. out between your fingers. Right. Otherwise, it could slide out and break. We're in a restaurant. He does not heed the suggestion. Oh. He keeps doing it. It slips out and breaks, and he's embarrassed in front of it because they got to come clean up after him, and he's never made that mistake again, <laughs> ever. He's got his pinky under every. He's got a pinky under stuff he doesn't need the pinky under, you know? Because <laughs> you can hold a wine glass with a stem. He's still got the pinky under it. Like, he don't even need it, but he's... So some lessons need to be firsthand, and that's part of exploring the world around you. It broke a glass, mm -hmm. but... That's simply the cost of that lesson. Education costs money. The president of Harvard once said, if you think the price of college is expensive, try the price of ignorance. Mm. It's way more costly than the price of knowledge. So, and another, I'm, I, you started this. I'm just, no, I'm, I'm, so you go. your, kid, your kid goes in the refrigerator and pulls out an egg. What's the first th thing you do? You say, don't do that, it might break. No, no, let that one, let that one play out, yeah. all right? So, so they, it's the egg, oh, this is solid. It's, they start playing with it, of course the egg is gonna break onto the floor. You learn something about brittle, that something can be brittle, it can be hard, but not strong. That's brittle for you, all right? Mm -hmm. A cookie is brittle, so it breaks. It shatters, and then the stuff comes out the middle. Some is, is yellow, and others has no color. And then, so now you learn what's inside an egg. And then you say, that was almost a chicken. And then you just blow the mind of the kid, all right? <laughs> and they say, wow, <laughs> are there any chickens in the others? I want to find out. And what did that cost you? What does an egg cost? It's 20 cents? Come on now. I, and I know it's, you don't want to waste food, but it's the economic, it's 20 cents. And it's the, that's the cost of the educational lesson. So I do that all the time and our house is a mess. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I do, I do want to come back to something that Sean just briefly touched on, um, is the National Science Foundation's uh, recent science and technology indicators, which is considered to be a solid survey of science culture and literacy in America and the world. And they've been running this survey for 30 years, or more than 30 years. Um, just because I, I'm finding some of these things that don't make total sense, and I want to get your take on it. So I'm just going to list off some stuff here. So 80% of Americans say that they are interested in new scientific discoveries. For the, at least the last three decades, roughly 80% of Americans strongly agree that research that advances the frontiers of knowledge is necessary and should be supported by the federal government. Um, yet, as Sean mentioned, one out of four people still think the sun moves around the earth. 61% of Americans. Well, one out of four is, is still is 25%. 25%. So that's like the other missing yeah, part of the 80 to 100%. So that's most of those po folks, I guess. I mean, I don't know. But well, go this, on. No, but this is, this, is, this is good because, and then 61% of Americans don't think the universe began with a huge explosion. Plus the added bonus this year, which was different from any other year, and they don't entirely know why, but these surveys do need some interpretation to get them right. More than 40% of people think that astrology is very scientific. This is new. This is the highest it's been in three decades. It's increasing. Our skepticism of astrology appears to be declining. Now, there's a strange blend of positive at the beginning. So, you know, we tend to be really interested in scientific discovery, yet, as we just talked about, the knowledge appears to be, there's just this blend, and I'm wondering what do you think is really going on? Yeah, I, I think these, the bad elements of this survey, <laughs> you, you know, you want to run around and beat people on the head, and no, 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 no. It's, part of it is a sign of the failure of the educational system. Not, uh, there, may, there could be other failures I don't know about. The one in particular I'm thinking of is the failure of the educational system to empower people to even know what science is as an enterprise. Because science class, you're learning stuff. You're learning facts, and that's an aspect of science. But if you don't know how science works, what it is, why it works, you are then susceptible to the rest of this kind of thinking, to pseudoscientific thinking, to thinking that you can cherry pick a scientific result that feels good to you and reject the others. That means you don't understand how science works. And I'm not going to debate you on that, on, on what you think is true. I'm going to have a conversation about what science is. And it's out of that, out of that seed, blossoms your skepticism for things someone might be telling you mm. about your love life or your financial, uh, because of where the planets are in the sky. Mm -hmm. And so it's the missing skepticism that is the problem, not simply the fact that that's what they think. Right. There's a great tweet that I love of yours. I love so many of them, but I think it was Macy's you wish it would oh. change from. So it, it's, you, Yeah, so every Thanksgiving, yeah. Macy's, <laughs> Macy's, we have the, the Thanksgiving Day Parade with the balloons. By the way, Macy's is the second largest consumer of helium in the world. You're kidding. Yeah, for those balloons. Other than, yeah, yeah, yeah. the sun. In the old days, they'd let the helium go, which would escape into space. Um, and now they recycle the, the helium. But so, so Macy's, the Amazing. parade would start up near where I work, the American Museum of Natural History. And it's great the night before, you see like Spider-Man rising up out of the pavement, mm. you know, as they fill them up. And you, if you're three floors up, you just see the head start to show up. <laughs> it's surreal, you know, with the dinosaur bones and things. And there's, you know, Snoopy. And, and, and so it starts there, and they parade down 8th Avenue and onto Broadway, and they end in front of Macy's. And, and splashed across the front of Macy's is a huge sign that says, a neon glowing sign that says, Believe. believe. And I, just, so I tweeted, I just, you know, I just tweet <laughs> it's just stuff that might. There's no, there's no plan with my tweets, okay? It just, just automatically flows out of his fingers. There's and, no, there's just stuff goes. I was thinking anyway. And it's the a, Twitterverse <laughs> happens to be a place to share the thought. And, and whereas before, the thought would have just disappeared into my cranium somewhere. The brain so, computer interface for that. I, so I tweeted, I said, would it be cool if one year, instead of the word believe, they put the word question? 
Just imagine how different, if, the, if that was the messaging, imagine how much less duped we would be by people who would get you to think things that have no evidence for it at all, and you change your life, pivot your life on it, and then say, well, why, what are you doing? And how, what, what, we have the power of mind that allows you to probe what is true in the world and to abandon that because someone pers is persuasive and, and says, just believe, everything will be okay. And I, I, we're in a free country, I'm not gonna make you believe or not believe, but just be aware of the consequences of that to our culture, to our civilization. If we're trying to go into the 21st century and be competitive, you can't just say, let's just believe we'll be competitive. Yes, oh, let's, I have an idea. No, I, I gained 10 pounds last month. Uh, uh, let me repeal the law of gravity. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that'll help my bathroom scale. So you can't just choose what is true and what isn't. It's not how the world works. It's not how science works. Of course, the consequences of putting question across Macy's is a lot of angry parents having to explain to their children why Santa exists. <laughs> that would be a little bit difficult. Um, let's oh, can I give an example yeah. about that? <laughs> you know, how do you raise your kids, right? So, so it wasn't until I was a parent that I learned why the tooth fairy works. Because at the age you are losing teeth, you still have a certain gullibility about the physical world. Mm -hmm. And at the age where you, you stop losing teeth, it, it wouldn't work anyway, right? So it's this slice of your life where your parents lie to you, all right? And, all right, fine. So I don't like lying to my kids, but I don't want to deny them certain uh, uh, pleasures of childhood, all yeah. right? So here's how I did it. And I invite, if you don't, not a parent yet, I invite you to try this. So uh, my daughter lost a tooth, and I said to her, I heard <laughs> that if you put the tooth under your pillow, the tooth fairy will come and swap it out with money. And she said, really? I, I, I just heard that. I don't know, sure. <laughs> so then she does it, and we sneak in, and you know, and she wakes up, there's money there. And she said, uh, Daddy, look, look what the tooth fairy brought. And I said, uh, how do you know it was the tooth fairy? Right. Wait, wait, and she said, well, you told me it was, I said, no, I told you that I had heard that. I don't know for sure. Wait, 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 wait. And so it, the next few teeth, you only got a certain number of teeth to do this, these experiments. And so to, the only certain number of repeat attempts here. So, so the next couple of teeth, she tried to rig her room so that if anybody came in the room, it would make a noise, a tooth fairy, and so that she would wake up. But she never woke up, and she still kept getting money. Then there was the suspicion that maybe the parents were involved. Mm. So she got together with friends of her at school and said, all right, whosever tooth comes out in the schoolyard, don't tell your parents that. Put the tooth under the pillow and see if the tooth fairy comes. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So that experiment was coordinated. They did it. There was no money under the pillow. So they kept believing the tooth fairy. <laughs> they wanted the money. <laughs> so they, they, so we, we, I, I'd like to believe, believe mm -hmm. uh, that this turned what was a fun childhood thing into an investigative experiment. And I think she was stronger example. for it at the end. Yeah, that's a great example. Yeah. Well, <laughs> let's move on to some science. Sure. I know you have a, a globe back here. Do I, don't look you, back there. Did you call for that? Did I call? Yeah, I brought that all the way from Brooklyn. OK, um, all right, that's fine. We'll bring that out shortly, okay. very shortly. It's, it's, it's 20 inches in diameter. Or, OK, an yeah, Earth so, beach ball. Okay. So it's a beach ball. It's not 12-inch school. That's fine. So just start doing the math in We're your cool. head, because you know what's coming, I think. Maybe. I, I think he's know. reading it. He knows. Um, so, so about a week and a half ago, NASA's Kepler mission announced that they had discovered another 715 new exoplanets. And these are, thank you, an exoplanet fan. Um, so, 
so uh, for, for anyone who, you know, who wants to know what an exoplanet is, it is a, uh, a planet... This audience knows okay, what an exoplanet right, is. Uh, gonna... Who do you think you are? I, this is <laughs> South by Southwest Interactive, okay? Yeah. This is Geek Central right here, okay? <laughs> okay. But you know what's cool? Uh, exoplanet, we get that. You've seen the word exo in exoskeleton? He's going to do it. Like, like Iron Man or uh, lobsters. So exo is... No, this is a great, this is a great <laughs> education. No, no, so exo is, is beyond the limits of where you were before. So, so exoplanets around other stars. We have exobiology. This mm -hmm. would be the biology, uh, the study of life that might thrive on another planet. Yeah. Right, so outside of our solar system. So th this brings our number of exoplanets up to, I mean, depending on candidates and all the rest of it. 1,000 around two, there. 2,000 maybe even? No, no, it's, I, well, I don't remember. I didn't check this morning, so, but uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's above 1,000. <laughs> definitely above 1,000. I think the 715 definitely sets us right. pretty close. I would encourage you not to become too attached to, those to the number of things. Yeah. The number, there is no physics in the, in the number, number of things. things. There is okay? no Okay? Unless you're counting point. quarks. There's, right. there's, so all the nine planet people out there, <laughs> just get over it, all right? It can change at any time. It's eight. I know. So, right. so it's because you got attached to the number because it was taught that way. There are nine planets in the solar system, and you are in third grade, and you think there's something magical important about that number. When it's just a count that whatever what we... <laughs> so I, I interrupted. Go on. No, no, that's... I mean, I, I love your interruption. Don't get me started on Pluto, because that'd be... No, I... I yeah. That would derail the whole thing off it to was, the side. I, I am so close to asking if any child has written you back to apologize, but I, let's... Yes! Let's, one has! No way! Yes! All right, now... Yes! Now we're going to have to... No, I wish I had the letter here. I need another hour. Because I'm going to tell you, you're not even going to believe it. It's a letter oh. from a guy who's 21 years old. He said, this, it's, it is a seriously written as a letter can be. So, Dear Dr. Tyson, I want to apologize oh. because back <laughs> when I was in fourth grade, uh, I want to apologize. I've come to learn why you made the decision you did and others of your colleagues for demoting Pluto and making it a dwarf planet. I now see the, how the, why the science uh, needs that to be so and <clears throat> I want to apologize for the letter I sent to you in fourth grade calling you a poo-poo head for doing the, making this decision. <laughs> Sincerely, so this is the letter. Amazing. Apologize for saying I was a poo-poo head. <laughs> there is an apology, that's all I'm saying. No, that, I, I, I wasn't... It's the one apology one. I got. Well, if you get one, there's 10 others that have been considering it. So I have 11 apologies, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> back, back, to, back to exoplanets. In other news, um, what's... What's the really, what are the implications of finding all of these exoplanets, and we're about to find more, we're assuming? Uh, well, so, well, not really, because Kepler is Kepler's a, done, sort of dead in the water. Data keeps coming in. Dead in space. DIS has been dissed. Uh, Kepler, I was at, at the Kepler headquarters about a year ago, uh, two years ago, and these planets were in the pipeline. Right. Back then, they were planet candidates, and they don't want to announce until they're really sure and have high confidence. And so you have the blips of data that come in, they verify it, they get secondary measurements, and they move on. Right. And then they collect the catalog, and then they put them all out. Okay. So that's where the 750 came, so 15 right. came from. That they, and this right. is a key point. So what yeah. I like about it is we can now think of s classes of star systems. Mm -hmm. This many, many of those, in fact, it might have been all of them, are planets orbiting stars that already have other Planets, planets in orbit around them. That's so right. now we can speak of star systems. And uh, is our solar system average? Is it weird? Is it, how many do we have in the Goldilocks zone versus these other systems? Mm -hmm. So you can start, you can start twisting your way into the questions you can now ask. Which? Because before the data, it was like, are there planets that orbit other stars? Okay. Right. 
Got that. Are there planets like Earth that orbit other stars? Got that. Got it. Are there planets that, like Earth orbit other stars that are in the Goldilocks zone? We got that. Okay, Do, might those planets have life? That is the current frontier. We got top people. There's a way to think to decide whether they have life without going there. Because you this, don't want to go there. I, I want to know this. You don't yeah, want to go there this is... just yet. Oh, no. No, no, I'll <laughs> tell you why. Because if I put you on the fastest spaceship we now have, yeah, we'll never. the fastest spaceship and you go to a star 10 light years away, it would take about 100 and 150,000 years to reach it. So, so you don't want to do experiments that take longer than your life expectancy. Uh, <laughs> or you can go on a generational ship right. and you just have to be really fertile, okay? <laughs> so that multiple generations down the line will arrive. So in these planets, they're on a frontier. It's a cottage industry in astrophysics today right. where if the planet moves in front of its host star, mm -hmm. the light from the star will pass through the atmosphere, come out the other side, and the chemistry of the atmosphere will lay a fingerprint into the light of the star, allowing ah. you to decode the chemistry, chemistry of the air. And it turns out, unlike what we had ever imagined before, like in the days in the early Star Trek, they would land on a planet and they say, what kind of planet is it? Oh, it's oxygen, nitrogen, atmosphere. It's okay, and they'd get out and they could breathe. That's why you never see them with breathing apparatuses. And so that implied that there were just oxygen, nitrogen planets out there. Excuse me, you don't have oxygen unless something is actively making it, such as life. You don't have methane in an atmosphere unless something is actively making it, because these two molecules are chemically active. Mm -hmm. They do not stay unconnected to something else for long. So we look for what are now called biomarkers mm -hmm. in the atmospheres of those planets, which would tell us if we were going to pick one to visit, mm -hmm. which one mo what might most likely have biology that we are most familiar with. What about the search for life as we don't know it? Search for life as we don't know it. So you want like something made of silicon Horta, or something. Silicon, Horta from Star Trek. Well, Horta we, from The can Rock. We, can we find that? Yeah. Uh, and, okay. and how, how, how do we even look for something that we don't even know what it is? Yeah, yeah, you could I mean, be, this is, such is a, the chair alive? Yeah, you know, you know is it, just, is, uh, it, it feels alive. Sometimes. Yeah, uh, so the Horta in the first run of Star Trek back yeah. in the 60s, it was life based on silicon, and silicon is an, uh, an active ingredient in rock. So mm -hmm. this thing was a rock. I think even Bone said, it's a rock, Jim, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, you need, yeah. It's a rock. So, in fact, it was a pregnant rock. It had baby rocks inside of it. Oh, God. Um, and it's odd, because the, the babies were spherical eggs. I'm just wondering, would a rock need to be born out of a smooth egg? Wow, you are so curious. I'm just wondering. But, but anyhow. I just can't. No, no. It's a I rock. I've never met anyone just so have curious. Just, it's a rock. Yeah. Yeah. So, so here's, the, here's the issue. The reason why people suggest silicon, there's a, there's a good chemical reason for this. Right. Silicon appears directly below, directly below carbon on the periodic table. We are carbon-based life, right? So if you are vertical on the periodic table, you may remember that you have the same configuration of your outer electrons, which means you make the same kinds of molecules mm -hmm. chemically as everybody else above and below you. So if carbon can make life, mm -hmm. surely silicon can as well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you can make the similar molecules, but some properties are different, all right? If you make silicon, bind it with oxygen, that's a, that's, uh, what's called binding energies are different. So if you assault an environment, will you break apart the molecule and have a new experiment ready, ready to roll? Mm -hmm. No, because you're a rock, okay? so. Whereas if, you're, if your molecule's based on carbon, you can hang together pretty good, good. but if there's an assault on the environment, you break apart the molecules, yep. and then there's more experimenting to go on. Mm -hmm. This is how we grow the diversity of life on the Earth. It's not by having rock-hard molecules to make your life. And so that's, so, so this, so silicon, in principle you could do it, 
Right. But it's not clear that you'd have the, ex the experimenting in nature that is required uh. to find self-replicating life that then creates a diversity. But more important than that, oh. sorry, I, just, I didn't mean to point That's at okay. you with a spiral I finger. <laughs> <laughs> it was, <laughs> is, uh, is that carbon is more abundant in the universe than is silicon. Right. Less, uh, let, by a factor of five or something. So you don't even need to appeal to silicon because carbon is there for you. And if you've got the carbon and you can make more kinds of molecules with carbon, carbon. Mm -hmm. than any other kind of molecule of, out of all molecules in the world of molecules, then we're good to go. So I'm okay That's thinking that life elsewhere is based on carbon. If yeah. you have to pick, a, pick an atom to base life on, it, carbon it, is your atom. It might be microbial, but it'll be there. It, it might be microbial, but it'll be there. And carbon, because of its configuration, it combines every which way. That's I, right. It's I, a great, I had John Stewart, great atom. A great atom. I, I had John I, Stewart I on my, on my, on my yeah. uh, Star Talk oh, oh, radio yeah, show yeah. Uh, podcast. We, we and know him. Did you know John Stewart from Daily Show? You know, he, they know. he started majoring in chemistry when he went to college. I said, cool. And I said, I asked him the next geeky question. Did you have a favorite element? He said, yes. Oh. And I said, oh, what was it? He said, carbon. And I said, yes. Was, but then I wanted to know why. Because I want to know why. So I said, John, why, why was it your favorite element? He said, because it was the slut of the periodic table. Oh, it combined. Nice. Forwards, backwards, every which way. So I said, wow, that's, that's some good stuff right there. That's, that's like comedy on the periodic table. Um, so he understood the significance of carbon relative to everything else. And uh, I thought that was a, uh, uh, so, so in the universe, you might expect carbon. Now, does life require liquid water? Maybe, Maybe. all it requires is liquid. Oh, anything. Well. On one of Saturn's moons, Titan, oh, it yeah. is so cold yeah. that methane, methane right. has normally familiar as the gas that comes out of your stove. Tip, if you live in the city, it's methane. Mm -hmm. Suburb is propane, typically, but methane is a flammable gas. It is so cold on Titan, methane has liquefied, and it has become lakes and rivers. There are meandering rivers and river deltas on um, Titan, Titan of running methane. And methane is chemically reactive just the way oxygen is. Mm -hmm. So now we imagine mm -hmm. life, life on Titan with methane as, the, as the, the fluid that is carrying nutrients from one mm -hmm. part of the creature mm -hmm. to another. We, I will not rule that out. And if that's the case, then this whole concept of a Goldilocks zone has to be revisited. Because you could have a methane Goldilocks zone. That's right. Or an ammonia Goldilocks oh. zone. Oh. Ooh. Pick your favorite chemical and imagine life that way. Wow, I don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> just, uh, th there is something that, uh, Neil is amazing at, um, obviously with analogy and giving a sense of scale to things that are very difficult to imagine. And I just, I, I adore this one thing that he does and I'm wondering if we could do a little Illustration. I have no idea what you want me to do. Oh, okay. We're gonna, you're going to need to pick two volunteers. Pick two volunteers. It's, this is a front row thing, I guess. Uh, two, two, two volunteers. Okay, right there on the corner. And how about right here in the middle, okay? Step right up. Are they coming up here? Where, where do they? Uh, yep. You, you, you will direct them. But... That camera is like from 1885. Where'd you get that camera? <laughs> Hold up that camera. I've seen that in museums. <laughs> no, no, it's actually a digital, uh, a digital update, but it, it keeps the old. Hello, I'm Neil. Yes. Hello, hi. Hey. I'm Isaac. Isaac, hello. Isaac. Hello. Do you want to hold the earth? I, I'm terrified to... that I'm going to hold it the wrong way. Now, I had to, I'm going to get two other. Uh, the, the, the ice cap is melted completely, apparently, <laughs> fr from the north. Now, as I. Because as they I got, said, these are okay here. So if you melt the north ice cap, all that ice is floating. So you don't raise the water levels on the Earth because they were already in the water. And so that doesn't change. It's only if you melt, where did it go? Uh, Greenland, which they, oh, uh, oh, Greenland is already melted here. There's no ice on the top of that. Oh, uh, but we started? do have ice in Antarctica. 
So this is maybe how far in our future? You know, Neil, we're going to be doing something oh, else. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, I got Earth here. I don't know. <laughs> I, I absolutely sure, go. made an error here. But uh, anyway, What's that? now, now what, yeah, what are these things? I don't know. But I, I was terrified of making a mistake in front of Neil, obviously. This is about the size of the moon. Thank God. Yes. Got it right. That's about the size of the moon. 20 inch in diameter. This is five inches. So who knew the moon was that large? This is Mars. Sure, that could be Mars. Yeah. It could be Mars. 10 inches? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's that about right? right, sure. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. awesome. We're on a roll. So, do you want to hand the, the moon, and we're going to do uh, an experiment of how far, to this scale, if we're according to this scale, how far away the moon might be? Oh, sure. So, okay, so okay, I'll give you the moon. Here, come here, come here, come here. Stand right here. Okay, you now have the moon. And so, You're gonna have so to... put it where, you, where the moon is relative. Where do you, Earth is the where size. Do you think it is? Right about there? That's, a, that's about the right distance? Given that this is 20 inches and this is five, you think the moon is? Right about there. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Um, th that is way off, okay? <laughs> okay, okay. Um, uh, just start backing up. Yeah, and me Keep going. Okay. Keep going. Keep going. Turn, turn around while you're going. Keep going. That, that's about right. Yeah. That's about the Earth-Moon distance. Yeah. You know why? You've been lied to by textbooks that have to squeeze them both into the same page. Okay? So the textbook has them drawn correctly relative to one another, but they can't possibly show you the, the, the distance because it'd be on 17 pages later. So they lie to you. So thank you for yeah. that. And then the positioning bit. of Mars, which of course we're going to have to send. Oh yeah, okay. Much so, further. so, well, well you know it's got to be farther than the moon. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to say, I'm going to really save you this effort here. Yeah, yeah. So, so Mars would be like out in like Town Lake. Town Lake. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, but yeah, Did it'll. Yeah, no, it's actually be like a, a little. It'll be like a mile and a half away, which is farther away than Town Lake. So you've got to trot up to the state capitol and okay. just wait there for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have yeah. a camera there. Yeah, it's, it's, space is empty. So it's, it's it's really empty. You know, the people who say this is a universe made for us. No, it's not. <laughs> Most of the universe is completely empty, and you'd be dead within seconds if put there. And it's also true for Earth's surface. If I drop you butt naked in 70% of Earth's surface, uh, you're dead some minutes later because you'd freeze, you'd be mm -hmm. eaten, you'd, because you don't have your 30-06 if I drop you butt naked. Um, so most of Earth's surface is hostile, mm -hmm. and we create these environments so that we are comfortable to shield us from all the ways Earth wants to kill us. Can, yeah. okay. can you illustrate where? In this dynamic, let's pretend that you were, st where is my moon? My moon went that way. Here, toss it. Anyway, the moon is still over there. Oh, wow, we're going to do that? Wow. I half expected you to levitate all of these things anyway. Um, I do not reveal that. Uh, so if the moon is approximately 50 feet, I think, 30 yeah, okay. to 50 mm -hmm. feet from here, this would be, to this scale, a mile away. Show us where the International Space Station is, Hubble, et cetera. Where oh, okay, at. so if the Earth were actually mm -hmm. this, uh, this size, uh, the International <laughs> Space Station would be orbiting about a half an inch above the surface. And that dude who jumped out of a perfectly good balloon, um, <laughs> what's his name, Felix! Felix Bumgardner, uh, he would have been about two millimeters above the surface of this globe. That's his edge of space jump. <laughs> now, so, you know, I, I don't, it's fine. He wants to, I don't have a problem if he does it, but the, the honesty of it would greatly diminish what I think people thought he was actually doing. And not only that, they made sure to photograph him standing there with a really wide angle lens, which curves horizontal lines. Right. So in the photo, you see this curvature of Earth's surface, and he said, wow, he's in space, look at that. No, he's not. At that height, you don't see, you don't see the curvature of the Earth if you are two millimeters above this beach ball. <laughs> it is, you just don't. <laughs> that stuff is flat. 
And then I showed examples of wide angle lenses, curving, horizontal. I tweeted that. You did. But I don't want to be a, a spoil, you know, curmudgeon or anything. I just wanted to put, I don't. <laughs> There's so much to actually be impressed with in the universe. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to be distracted by things that are not. That's all I'm trying to say. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Can I hold it? You can hold it. Can I hold her? I'm, <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I find that extraordinary. I mean, we have this sense of what we think space and the size of the moon and the size of Mars is, but until you see it, until, as Neil so kindly illustrates it for us, you need to see these abstractions and you need to have them clear so that we can then understand, okay, if we have not necessarily gone out into deep space, I do want to talk just before we go to questions for the audience a little bit about space exploration. When are we going to go? Will it just be governments that are going to take us there? Will it be an international collaboration? Is the fact that Jade Rabbit on the moon in China, is that even something that we should remotely think about or care about? What about the privatization and commercialization of space exploration? That's 17 questions I right know, there. Okay. I All know, right. but I just, so, I was like, I know. So just a couple but of things, so since, smart. since I'm holding Earth here, uh, the, the re one reason why we should go into space is because you know the dinosaurs would have if they could have. <laughs> 65 million years ago, right here, the tip, uh, the, the Yucatan Peninsula. Oh, yes. A rock the size of Mount Everest slammed into Earth, and it changed the climate of the world, rendering 70% of all species extinct. The dinosaurs are just the ones with the biggest teeth that we remember most, but that was a bad day on Earth. And so. <laughs> And, and, they don't, and the dinosaurs don't have opposable thumbs. They didn't have a space program. And so <laughs> I'm thinking if they did, they would have deflected that asteroid. And every, every now and then in my, in my Twitter stream, I, I just imagine a conversation with an alien, because I so want to meet the aliens. And I, and I say, and, and, and I, I, tell, I don't want to be the laughing stock among the galaxy's aliens to be a species intelligent enough to have a space program, to right. have actually gone into space, yet to go extinct because an asteroid came and we couldn't mobilize and figure out how to deflect it. We'd be the laughing stock of species in the galaxy, the extinct humans. We'd be in their museum say, here's what happens if... <laughs> <laughs> they'd be... They'd have human bones, you know, <laughs> on display in their museums. Here they are not building their next spaceship, right? <laughs> here, here they are. <laughs> so we get me started. You get me started on that. I, yeah. All right. So, so, so the farthest we've been is to the moon, and yeah, and, and that feels there. far on this scale. Right. Shrink that puppy down. It's nothing compared to the, the planets and the rest of the stars. So. Nothing. I, the, the space is a frontier, and I don't need to convince this audience of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's some practical reasons, I think. I want to go because it's cool and you discover stuff. But there are some practical reasons that I think should not be overlooked. Yes, you want to be looking up if the asteroid is going to come and take us out so that you would deflect it. And if you live in, a, in, a, in, a, in an innovation nation where people are scientifically literate, whether or not you are a scientist, you want to be around people who will, upon learning this, there's an asteroid headed our way? What, what's, the first, what's your first reaction when you learn this? Is it, run, <laughs> buy toilet paper, and water, and all, whatever you need to run, you can run. Or you can say, how can I deflect that? Mm -hmm. You want people around you who are thinking that way. And so space can render us extinct because the universe is one of the greatest killers of life. Um, so, but also, the innovations necessary to perform all of this, I think they can affect a culture in a way that turns everybody into people who think about tomorrow. And I'm online speaking at length about this, but, and I don't want to overstate it here, but if you, the day you stop thinking about tomorrow, you stop innovating. Right. Why else would you innovate? Oh, sure, you can innovate because you want to make a buck. I got that. But if, the, if your best innovative thought is what next app I can put on my smartphone, 
rather than tackling huge challenges that face our civilization today in transportation, in energy, in health, in security. These are major branches of our civilization that I don't see us giving attention to. Mm -hmm. And if you go into space where your health, energy, security, safety, all of these are frontier issues. Mm -hmm. If you're advancing a frontier, this stuff just rains out of the sky as uh, things that contribute to where we are in our civilization. And so uh, space exploration is a long-term investment mm -hmm. on the health and wealth of a nation. And it's the kind of investment that private enterprise cannot lead. I don't care what they tell you. They're, they're going to tell you. Uh, uh, you know, after SpaceX brought cargo to the space station, headlines, new era for space exploration, private enterprise leading the frontier. No! They brought cargo to the space station. NASA's been doing that for 30 years, okay? Even before there was a space station, they were bringing cargo up. So, so, the, the only, the, here's the, the challenge. The challenge is, if you lead a space frontier, it's expensive. Mm -hmm. Two, it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. Three, you don't know the risks. You can't quantify them. So if I'm a, an investor, in a, in a, I'm a business investor, and I ask you, uh, oh, you want my investment money in your space adventure? Um, uh, is it yes, it's very dangerous. People will probably die. Um, okay, how much will it cost? I don't know, but it's a lot. Uh, what will my return on the investment be? I have no idea, probably nothing. Okay, so <laughs> on that first voyage, it's nothing, all right? So you get no investors. You cannot create a capital market valuation on going into space first, or doing anything big and expensive first. The first Europeans to the New World were not the Dutch East India Trading Company. It was Columbus, paid by Spain. And Spain didn't say, oh, Christopher, um, come back and tell us who, what all the beautiful th lands you saw. No, it was, here's a satchel of flags. Put them wherever you step and they all say Spain on them, all right? There's a whole other motivation for sending Columbus, okay? And that was driven mm -hmm. by national interests that can afford to have a longer baseline of time than the quarterly report mm -hmm. of a business. Of, now, once that's done, and you draw the trade winds and who, where the hostels are and where the food su supplies are, then private enterprise comes back, and I'm all for it. They should be every place they possibly can be in space. And quoting Peter Diamandis, one of the founders of the X Prize, I agree with them 100%. The first trillionaire in the world is going to be the person who first mines asteroids. It'll be that valuable. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> so, you know, there's a whole a of set of elements on the periodic table called rare Earth, Earth elements <laughs> because they're rare on Earth, all right? <laughs> That's why they're called rare earth elements. In space, space did a lot of filtering for you. There are asteroids that are the, that are the, that are the core of planets that never fully formed and broke apart. But the planet, while it was trying to get underway, it was liquid or mm -hmm. fluid. And when you're liquid, heavy things fall to the middle and light things rise to the top. Then you freeze. The, the geologists call it differentiation, all right? So, you get for free the heavy stuff in the middle. Break that all apart, reach in, grab the asteroid that's made of the middle stuff. Mm -hmm. and you know what's in that middle stuff? Gold, platinum, iridium, iron, nickel. All the stuff that pe people have fought wars over, that are tracked on the stock market, that we use in industry. Uh, and so, yeah, that's the first trillionaire right there. So, the, well, we, we're running out of time. We're going to move to the audience. So. This is our first question that's come up on Twitter. What is the most frustr I can't frustratingly misunderstood scientific fact? What is the most frustratingly misunderstood? Uh, okay, uh, I got one. Well, there's many. There's so many to choose from. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't know. I people think that it's summertime because Earth is closer to the sun, mm. and they're not thinking that simultaneous with your summer, like Australia is having their winter, 
and they're like the same distance from the sun as you are, so people don't really think that through. <laughs> um, it's when people don't think something through that, that frustrates me. People will say something heavy falls faster than something is light. Have you, can you can do that experiment? Uh, you know, I, I can do that. You know, my, my boot is heavier than the moon right here. And this is Galileo did this experiment, okay? Bam! Oops. They fall together at the same speed. They did! All right? I got this. So, things that people are just told. I got one, you ready? Yes. It's darkest before dawn. No, it's not! It's, <laughs> it's like darkest when the sun is farthest from the horizon it could possibly be, and that's at your midnight, all right? But darkest before dawn became this, this psychological, yeah. it's like, well, you're at your deepest point, but the dawn was, I'm sorry, <laughs> it's false, okay? Uh, another one, what goes up must come down. No, that's because you're not throwing it hard enough, all right? <laughs> if you, you throw that sucker at seven miles per second, that's gonna leave Earth and go to the edge of the universe and not come back. <laughs> the escape velocity of Earth. So, so I, people say the sun is yellow. No, it's not, it's white. All right? If the sun were yellow, just think this through. If the sun were yellow, then in broad daylight, snow would be yellow. Mm. But generally, it's not, all right? <laughs> There are fire hydrants. There's some yellow places. Uh, people, when the sun sets, its light is heavily attenuated by dust in the atmosphere. And in, in the southwest, it's, it's, it's dust. Other places, it could be pollution or pollen. But these particles in the mm -hmm. air scatter blue light out of the sun into the rest of the sky, turning the sky blue. And the more blue light it takes out, the more yellow-red the sun looks. Right. And that's why right on the horizon, the sun is its deepest yellow red it will ever be. And people say, oh, there's our yellow star. No, it's, it's, the sun is white, okay? <laughs> Ask any photographer, by the way. In fact, to a photographer, the sun is blue, all right? Am I right here? He, he's right, the guy with the camera I was making fun of, he agrees, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Ludwig Herrera asks, what is the current scientific question you have and would like to have, or and would like to have, or find its answer? Yeah, uh, there's one, I don't know yeah. if we can get an easy answer to it, I wonder if we are smart enough to actually figure out the universe. Ah, does science because, have a limit? Because we define ourselves as intelligent. Well, because we came up with the test for that, right? <laughs> yeah, here, here, we give the test to the worm. No, that failed it, okay. The butterfly, no, no. The gorilla, no, can't do long division. We can do, <laughs> and so we are intelligent, we tell ourselves. And, but by our own measures right. are we intelligent, but not by from some measure outside of ourselves. Right. So suppose there were aliens, I've said this, suppose there were aliens who had the same genetic difference from us that we have from chimps, but in the intelligence scale. And what's the smartest thing a chimp has ever done? Maybe combine some rudimentary hand gestures, stack some boxes and reach a banana, do some finger painting, our toddlers do that. So, get that next species that we've never met, mm -hmm. where they are to us what we are to chimps, or rather chimps are to us what we are to them, then the smartest among us in their world is. would be like little Timmy coming home from grade school. Okay, they can roll Stephen Hawking forward and say, this one is slightly smarter than the rest of those humans, because he can do astrophysics calculations in his head like little Timmy over here. But put, put his latest equations up on the refrigerator, isn't that cute, all right? If, if that's us next to those, to those aliens, mm -hmm. we are drooling, blithering idiots with no hope of figuring anything out for the rest of our lives. That's depressing. I think right. about that all the time. Have oh, a nice day boy. on that one. Yeah. Oh, man. But, but, but uh, that's a... But keeping it anchored in science issues, that I, I want to know what dark matter is and dark right. energy. I want to know how you go from an organic molecule to self-replicating life. life. I want to know what was around before the Big Bang. That's kind of cool. I'd love to check that out. We've got top people working on all of this, by the way. But I, I want to know if there's life swimming under the icy surface of Europa. One of Jupiter's moons. There's a movie just came out called Europa. You love Check it Europa. Out. I love, love me it. some Europa. And, and you know what I wonder? You if you find life on Europa, then 
what would you call it? There's only one thing. It would have to be oh. Europeans, right? That's what it would be. <laughs> That's what it would have to be, I think. <laughs> Dr. I'm pretty Neil sure. deGrasse Tyson, everyone. <laughs> So what's, the, what's, next what's the next one? Um, Jim Kidwell, what can we do to shut down oh, climate change deniers once and for all before it's too late? Okay, so I'm not here to shut any, it's a free country. People always say whatever they want, deny whatever they, I'm not here to shut you up. I'm here to tell you how science works. Mm -hmm. Once you know that, I'm pretty sure you'll be less prone to deny emergent scientific truths just because they conflict with your political philosophy. Hmm. That's my answer. <laughs> so you don't shut down the deniers, you improve the educational system. That's how you do it. Well, we... And then it's too late, obviously, but then... <laughs> oh, by the way, let me just set the record straight. Um, if we melted all the ice caps, everything, we'll still be here. The climate change is yeah. not going to render us extinct. It will just completely redraw the coastlines of all the continents of the world. And all the great cities were typically were founded on shorelines mm -hmm. because that's where trade could mm -hmm. happen most effectively and most efficiently. And so you will lose most of your coast, the greatest cities on your coastline. And I'm just letting you know the causes and effects of your inaction. And then I just go back home. So <laughs> it's... In a free world, you ought to be able to choose your future. One of the goals of Cosmos is to empower people to think about science as something they can take ownership of, and then perhaps become better shepherds of our civilization and of the world. That's mm -hmm. it. It's to learn, yeah, to, and you've said this before, to learn how science works as opposed to learn science itself. Yeah, and to get your hands dirty in it. And this, this is similar to things we've already been discussing with children and how good they are at getting their hands dirty. They are natural scientists. Uh, from Luke Wright, uh, how do we keep kids interested in science as they become adults? What roles do schools play? We do know that if you don't catch kids early enough um, and make science and make them not terrified of the quadratic equation, we lose them. Uh, yeah, so I think I, 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 I can take a show of hands and I, I bet I'm right, okay? How many teachers in your lives, you're all the educated folks out there, so you've probably had at least 50 or 100 teachers in your life from elementary school. Of those teachers, how many had sort of a singular impact on who and what you became as an adult? And I'm betting your answer can fit in the number of fingers on one hand. Ray, is, how many has it been one teacher? Two teachers. Three teachers. Four. Five. Okay, six. Okay, like three people. So the number went up and then quickly went back down as we passed five. So out of, out of scores of teachers that we've all had, only three or four were truly meaningful in our lives. And so I think you ask how do you how do you keep adult yeah, keep the, the kid curiosity going into adulthood you clone those teachers okay <laughs> they're the first candidates for the cloning machine all right and and so what i tell teachers is to be the teacher that was that teacher to you hmm. and in there is their enthusiasm their excitement you end up liking their subject even if you didn't care about their subject because they brought enthusiasm to it so, and a lot happens at home. Just keep letting your kids break stuff. Um, that is a source of curiosity that stokes it. And so that's, that would be my advice. So just have a, a, a broken, broken stuff budget. <laughs> and count that as part of the cost of education of your kids. We are um, nearing out of time, and I mean, already oh, it's happened. I know. We just began. I know, we just began. I could do another hour easily. No. <laughs> Encore. Well, I noticed that, that this earth has air in it. Um, you do, you're, you're, you're very observant. Yeah, yeah, I was just checking that out. Um, cool. well, do you have anything to say about that? <laughs> um, 
What made you say that? that oh, another thing. I just like riffing on Earth. You notice how fully a third of our longitude is the Pacific Ocean? That makes the Pacific Ocean a really good place to drop satellites that you're done with out of orbit. So it's the great satellite toilet bowl of the Earth. <laughs> and if you drain the Pacific, uh, you'd find all ma you'd find Skylab, you'd find all kinds of uh, broken <laughs> satellites. So that's where I'm going to go um, when we uh, when the opposite of global warming happens. We have snowball Earth. All the waters evaporate, snow onto the land, and the snow stays there. And it just keeps evaporating until you drain all the oceans. Then you just walk around and pick up all the satellites. Um, <laughs> just like golf balls. Start a museum. Um, yeah. So much we've talked about has been inspiring, and, 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 is the, and one of the messages I've certainly gotten is to hold on to your curiosity and to let yourself become you know, awe-inspired um, by, by things that you don't know or things that you need to learn more, but actually take action upon things that you're inspired by. And one of the things that, Neela, maybe we can end on this, I don't know whether you can quickly just describe the cosmic perspective for us, because for me, oh, yeah. Yeah, that, I can do that. that gets me every time I, I that. might start crying, <laughs> but if you, could, if you could leave us with a note of that, that would be, that would be wonderful. Um, sure, uh, I, I can do that. Uh, I, I want to say that uh, before I leave with a cosmic perspective, I, I see the pendulum sh swinging back. We spent a couple of decades there where it was fashionable to deny science in a big way, in an audacious way, to at a party chuckle about how badly you did in science. Oh, and thanks. I think the tone has shifted where the geek culture, I think, is rising up within the broader culture. And that geek culture are, are good people doing good things. It's an educated culture. It's a, it's a culture that will one day run the country and perhaps the world. And they do not fear science. They embrace science. They, whether or not they are themselves scientists, you don't have to be a scientist to appreciate and embrace the methods and tools of that enterprise. And uh, I've seen the media attention given to the release of Cosmos. In 24 hours, it's going to premiere on television, but there's, there's been a, the media leading up to it has been nothing short of extraordinary. It's been in the New York Times, in the LA Times, in People Magazine, in GQ, in USA Today, in Time Magazine, in, and it goes on and on and on and on. And that's just the print attention given to the release. And so, and, and it's being distributed around the world in 180 uh, countries and 45 languages. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, and then I, I look at like my Twitter following, it's like 1.7 million Twitter, I said, did I remind you that I'm an astrophysicist? Don't, did I tell you that? Like, because I don't know how this number is so. Well, how does that happen? And it must mean that there's a hunger out there. There's an appetite that has not been filled, that is waiting to be served. And I claim, I assert, that Cosmos is landing on fertile ground because science is becoming mainstream. And we just learned in a press release hours ago, hours ago, That's right. that Monday night on Fox, in the 30 seconds at the beginning of the first episode of Cosmos, President Obama is going to introduce the show. So. With the President of the United States participating in the rollout of a scientific adventure, I think there's no greater evidence, that combined with all the rest of this, that uh, I think we do have a future that we can dream of. And that future will be informed by innovations in science and technology, and this community especially, I think, is going to lead that. So uh, let me just leave you with a scientific perspective that um, you know, people look up at night and many people feel small. That's understandable because, in fact, you are small. We are small. Uh, we're small. Just, you thought Felix Bumgarner's jump was high up. 
It's not, okay? So not only was that not big, we're not big. All right, we're not big not only in space, but in time and size. Mm -hmm. There's very little that would otherwise distinguish us, except for our capacity to wonder, to be curious. It's been suggested that humans are, are among the, f this is speculation, but mm -hmm. I, it's intriguing speculation. Humans among all animals, especially mammals, are the only ones who are completely comfortable sleeping on our backs. Think about how vulnerable other animals are. We sleep on our backs, no problem. We also sleep at night. Well, if you sleep on your back at night and you wake up, what are you looking at? The night sky, the lights in the void of darkness. It may be that our cosmic curiosity, for which I used to think I was biased. Yeah, I'm cosmically curious, but why should I think others are as well? You are. I'm not biased. I know you are. <laughs> if there's a light in the sky moving, you're going to stop and take a look at it. Mm -hmm. The universe intrigues us all. There may be some genetically encoded force that we illuminate, that we bring forward when we look up at night mm -hmm. and wonder, where did we come from? Mm -hmm. Where are we now? Where are we headed in the future? And the cosmic perspective is one where all of Earth is one. Because though this be 20 inches across, with political boundaries identified, when actually viewed from space, it's just ocean, land, and atmosphere. From space, we are not compelled to divide ourselves because we occupy this lone, frail spaceship Earth. And when you are not compelled to divide yourself, there's the urge to say we're in this together. Mm -hmm. We're in this so much together that You know, you think of family, and you say, that's my family, but you're not in my family. Excuse me. The boundary between what is in family and what is not is completely culturally determined. Mm -hmm. It's cultural. Because any two of us in this room, if you go far enough back the tree of life, have a common ancestor. So we could draw it that far back and say, we are family. You can keep going back and find the common ancestor with the rest of the apes, with dogs, with an oak tree. We have DNA in common. And there's so many people who want to say we are special because we're different. But I have a different, I, I, I say we are special because we are the same. Mm. We are part of this, this world where we have DNA in common with yeast, with oak trees, with the, the, uh, the insects that scurry under brush. These are, this is the commonality of life on Earth. And then you learn about molecules and atoms. We have the same atoms that are in stars. So now you look up, it's, we are common with the universe as well. So for me, the cosmic perspective, which I know if people had, you would never be leading armies into battle. Do you know how ridiculous it looks to the person with the cosmic perspective that one general says to the other, I'm going to conquer that land across this line. You, you're going to do what? What? On this speck you call Earth? You, you're going to wage, you want to kill people? For what? For, for oil? For energy? For real? I, we got to look what, what? Uh, the cosmic perspective reorders what is important in this world. And it does it in, I think, the noblest of ways, by recognizing not what makes us all different, but what makes us all common, together, alone, with the fate of our planet and our civilization in our hands. Thank you. No, <laughs> that is the cosmic perspective. Thank, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.